God, our creator, our redeemer, and our provider. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And we love our neighbors as ourselves, as we give honor to our spiritual guides, to our illuminated spring mother, Mildred Davis Miller, who is holiness of blessed memory, Master Malvin Davis, to our Supreme Father, Marshall Davis, and our Supreme Mother, Aletha Ravina Davis Drake, to all the officers, loved ones, and students of the Spiritual Guidance Temple of Truth, to the people of all nations, to all living creatures, to all material manifestations, I greet you with Hotep, Shalom, peace, abide. For our scripture, I will read the 45th Psalm. Here beginneth. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verse for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent of men and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. Gird your soul, sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty and your majesty ride forth victoriously in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Let the right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemy. Let the not nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O Lord, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Your love, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, Lord, our, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassava. From palaces, anoint the ivory. The music of the spring make you glad. Daughters of the king are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride in gold of Ophir. Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Forget your, forget your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The city of Tri will come with gifts, and people of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess with her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments, she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her. Though those bought to be with her, led in with joy and gladness, they enter the palace of the king. Your sons will keep the place of your fathers. You may make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. I read the 45th Psalm in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Blessed Mother. Amen, amen, amen. Let us stand and repeat the Lord's Prayer in unison, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks be to God for his gifts of riches. Thanks be to God for his gifts of joy. Thanks be to God for his gift of health. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And now for our song. And the song is, I have a message from the Lord of what we, what is normally called is look and live. I think there's a brief, did I pull a song on this page? 
What did I do with the song? The music, music, one. Oh. It was there, though, wasn't it? You remember what I'm saying? Okay. Got two ways I can handle this. Where? I was on here. Okay. Okay. The song is Look and Live. <laughs> I've a message from the Lord, hallelujah, I've a message unto you to give, is recorded in the Lord, and now and then, the word hallelujah, and it's only that you look and live. Okay, I think I start in the middle of the song, <laughs> when I started it. So it wasn't, uh, we'll let it go. We'll go back to our full screen. Unless we didn't want us to sing all oh, the whole song. So we'll go to our meditation. And our meditation is uh, the original Ho'oponopono prayer uh, that was shortened, and the shortened version of it was given to us by... Uh, St. Megan on Mother's birthday. But today we want to do the, for our meditation, we want to do the full version of the Ho'oponopono. And this is a Hawaiian prayer technique. So please sit up erect and repeat after me. Divine Creator, Father, Mother, Son as One, if I, my family, relatives, and ancestors have offended you, your family, relatives, and ancestors, in thought, words, deeds, and actions, from the beginning of our creation to the present, we ask your forgiveness. Let this cleanse, purify, release, cut all the negative memories, blocks, energies, and vibrations, and transmute these unwanted energies to pure light. And it is done. Amen. 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 Now, as I said, that was the long version. It ends our devotion, I should say, first of all. But that was a long version of the Ho'oponopono, uh, which was a prayer technique, a Hawaiian prayer technique that was introduced to us, um, what was that, Monday? Uh, at a Supreme Mother's birthday celebration by uh, Sister Megan. And there's a shorter version of it. It, it. Well, what she introduced us to was a shorter version of it, but she told us that if you go on the website and look it up, you can find much more about Ho'oponopono. You can see how it's used for, um, for health, how it's used for money, uh, and different things that it's used for, and how it can be used as a short prayer for yourself or someone else that really has four major parts to her. There's a mantra that has four major parts to it. And in the short version, the Ho'oponopono is, I am sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. And for our consecration, when you're getting your, your gems, you need to remember those four Things, which you look 
Uh, in fact, you'll be looking to the mirror. And remember, she, as Megan taught them, you can say them for yourself or you can say them for someone else. You can tell yourself, your body, especially for your health, you can tell your body what? I am sorry for the way I've been treating you. Please forgive me. Thank you for the service you've done for me. And I love you as a short prayer. You can say it to your mind. Say it to your emotions. You can say it for a friend. You can use their name and tell them, tell them what? I am sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. So it is a prayer that can be used, adapted to many things. In fact, when you read some of the things that you talk about, Ho'oponopono, one of the things that that talks about with your finances, it says, you can say this to your money or the, how money comes to you. One of the things when they talk about Ho'oponopono about money is to saying, one of our biggest problems with money is how we misuse it. And we misuse our money. We misuse our resources. We spend them on the wrong thing. And sometimes we have to tell our money to release us to be able to receive more wealth or receive what we need. We have to let our money uh, know that what? I'm sorry from the way I've been using you. Please forgive me for the misuses that I've done with the money. Thank you for the blessings you brought me. And I love you. Even talking to your money, tell them you love to do it because if you, if you love it, you will actually treat it better from this Ho'oponopono standpoint. So Ho'oponopono is a, um, uh, something, like I said, we were introduced to this by uh, St. Megan, but it's something I think we should use and something we should study. As we study it, we'll show that it even talks about um, the four levels of consciousness um, that re relate to the, like the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the unconscious or superconscious mind. So it relates to those, those things as it's teaching. And uh, all, I think, fall in line with the teachings that we have received. So Ho'oponopono, which is again, a Hawaiian a prayer technique that, as I said, we'll be using it again. So remember those four things you need to say. Um, and you get to decide when you go pick up your things, who, who do you want to say it to? But is, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Any questions or comments about Ho'oponopono? And before we get into the lesson, the other thing that we want to talk about is the symbol that we're using called the Ankh. Now, the Ankh is a, a type of a cross shape, but on the top of the cross, there is a teardrop shaped loop uh, that's at the top of the cross. Uh, so it looks like a teardrop shaped loop with a cross bar, with a, 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 a vertical bar under it. And there are, you know, because of this ancient Egyptian, you know, there are a lot of things have to be hypothesized about what it meant and how it's pronounced. But with this, the very interesting thing about, ah, oh, come on on, come on in. We get to see the baby. It's beautiful. Ah, oh. how's everyone? I you know um, Dick and Jackson just said one of our CETA came, came in. That's what we were stopping. But in our lesson, we were talking about the symbol you see before you is called Ankh. It's an ancient Egyptian letter. And the interesting things about ancient Egyptian letters is that they are, um, well, three types of letters. The three types, the symbols are used in, well, four, but the three basic types of letters. Uh, as, as far as talking about syllables, how do you say them in syllables? There's just three ways that you can look at it in syllables. There's some letters that only represent one syllable. 
Like you can have a letter that represents F or A or B or G. But there are some letters actually represents two consonants, not just one. Um, and there are some that represent three consonants put together. So you can have sometimes that a letter could represent one consonant, it can represent two consonants, or it can represent three consonants. Ankh actually represents three consonants. Uh, if you consider a, um, a one consonant uh, that can be sound in different ways, it's, sometimes it's just written as sort of like a, if you see uh, on the screen, you'll see it just has like a little apostrophe, an N and then an H in this area here. Uh, well, that apostrophe is a consonant that could be several different vowels. And then the N and then the H uh, actually has a, a line under it, so it's a, a hard H sound. So that's how you get ankh out of it. Uh, that's why they put the KH, because it's likely it's a, a hard H sound. It's not the soft K sound. It's, the, it's like the word Hanukkah. When you see Hanukkah, um, it's really a hard H. Because you'll see some people pronounce, well, it looks like it should be called Chanukkah. But you don't, you don't call it Chanukkah. You call it what? Hanukkah. But it's supposed to be like a little gravelly sound before you say it. <laughs> it's supposed to be Hanukkah uh, when you're saying it. And the same way with Ankh. At the end of it, you just don't say an H, you say a hard H sound. But it's three letters. That's what I call this transliteral symbol. Um, and that's why I say there's three different ways that their letters uh, can represent consonant, consonants. And Ankh is representing three. Words can also represent a concept or they could represent a, um, an object. So the word ankh, when, it used, when it's used to represent a concept, it is considered life, is a concept of life. When it's used to represent an object, it is a mirror. It means a mirror. So in one sense, it represents life, but in also that same word, if you put like a, 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 a number symbol under it, it's like one mirror, not a life, but one mirror. And it was always, uh, and even say it can be a, a, a floral bouquet, all these things that you, the word ankh could mean all of those things. And they also tried to do some research, it doesn't mention here, but what is this shape trying to to represent. And one of the things they say the shape is trying to represent is a, the type of complex knot that you would have to tie to make a sandal. If you were making a sandal for your foot, you'd have something that had to loop around your angle, right? And then make part of it that goes over to the two sides of the shoe, but something that actually goes between your toe, right? So they're saying that it can represent this complex knot. Some people say it even uh, represents uh, um, uh, a woman's reproductive system with the two ovaries on the side, a chamber to receive the sperm and the womb that holds the sperm. So we can say it says all these things are symbolized in this ancient Egyptian symbol of an ankh. But when you think about those two things and you think about it, it could be a mirror, it could be life, it start making you think, did they kind of consider that life was sort of like the mirror that showed you who you are? That life, the things that we live and experience in life, the way you respond to it, it's just like you're looking at a mirror and you get to see yourself through the way you live your life or the things you encounter in life. How do you react to them? Just like if you take a mirror, because it's a mirror that you do what? It lets you see yourself. In a way, life lets you do what? See who you are by the way you react to things. 
So there's a lot uh, that, to me, when we teach universal symbolism, when you really start studying universal symbolism, you'll find that most of what we study as universal symbolism started off in ancient Egyptian letters. I know we study them from, uh, we do a lot of the study from the Hebrew letters, but even the Hebrew letters, when you look at the source of them, they can be traced back to ancient Egyptian symbols. So a lot of universal symbolism comes from ancient Egyptian symbols. And a lot of the ancient Egyptian symbols can be traced and related to African symbols. One of the books I've, I've gotten is talking about the Dogon. The Dogon is an African tribe. They're the African tribe that before they could know and see that there was a star on the other side of this star, uh, this pole star, that they knew about it. Uh, they knew that it had a strange gravitational uh, quality. As they said, if you got a rock from this planet, it would be uh, the, it would be heavier than any rocks down here. The Dogen talk about that, and now that they have actually been able to find that exactly where the Dogen said there was a star, there is a star, um, and that it is considered to be a what they call a dwarf star. And a dwarf star is a star that they say is like collapsing in on itself. And as it collapses in and on itself, its gravity becomes more. What making it collapse? is this gravity is becoming more and more intense. And so if you got a piece of that intense particle, it will be heavier than things that we would have here. Heavy when we look at it, and you might see it as a grain of sand, but that grain of sand would have such a heavy weight to it because it's actually condensed. All the molecules are, and atoms of it are condensing as they do that. So the thing that the Dogen told them about this planet was out there was actually there. But then when they start studying the Dogen more, they start saying, but wait a minute, a lot of these symbols we're seeing in the Dogen, which is this African tribe that's way down in the south part of Africa, we see some of those same symbols in ancient Egypt. And, uh, and I won't talk about this too long, but some of the symbols they say is they see in some of the symbols used by the Dogen and the ancient Egyptians, some of the same principles that they're coming up with in quantum mathematics and their string theory. They look at the way they think, uh, and I'll just go over one of them. Both the ancient Egyptians and the uh, Dogen has this thing that looks like a uh, uh, four, four loops of four stars, uh, four uh, teardrops connected up together. And uh, they ha always have like a curly, uh, curly winding symbol, and there's a third one, I can't think what the third one is, but when you look at string theory, string theory use these same type of images to show how they think the universe is composed. But when you look at ancient Egypt and you look at the Dogen, the Dogen with their, their little loopy thing, they said that is how the god they call Amon actually started the creation was from this symbol of these four things together, which is the same thing they're looking at quantum mechanics. Um, so they're trying to say that the ancient Egyptians and the Dogons may have understood quantum mechanics before our scientists even unraveled the mysteries of what they call irrational numbers. Because you can't get to quantum theory, hello, thank you, unless you started looking at what they call irrational numbers. And irrational numbers basically are fractions. Our mathematics system would try to uh, feel that fractions drive you crazy. That's why they call them irrational numbers. And they call them irrational numbers because one of their greatest uh, mathematicians who was looking, trying to investigate fractions more, uh, fractions deeper, going deeper and deeper into how they could use fractions, he actually went crazy. I mean, crazy, crazy. They had to put them in an insane asylum. Um, and because they, but, and because they call, because they put them in an insane asylum, they call fractions irrational numbers. They said irrational, they would make you irrational. 
And you sometimes you talk about, and you mean they're talking to uh, someone who's into math, they tell me he's going down the rabbit hole. That's the rabbit hole they're talking about. That he, you know, you kept talking to things in fractions so much that they think that if you do it too much, it drives you crazy. Only, and the reason was because is they didn't want to, they couldn't use fractions well. So they would actually tell you about, you know, when they, they would go to, you might remember in mathematics, they were telling you about integers, which are whole numbers. And you should do most of your math as whole numbers, not fractions, because they actually believed fractions did what? Drive you crazy. If you went too deep into fractions, it would drive you crazy. Until recently, when they found out that it took fractions for them to be able to figure out how to make computers replicate so many things, like how you can get a computer to generate a picture that looks like a shoreline, or how do you get a computer to be able to plot how you're going to go uh, uh, land something down from space. It takes fractions to be able to do that. And so they had to kind of rethink what they thought about fractions. And I'm probably getting off the point of the, we're just supposed to be talking about why I use this onk symbol as both a symbol for life and a symbol for um, a mirror. And as I said, when we get to the message, we're going to go over the message for the month. The message of the month is going to lead us into um, the prayer, we want, the, how we want to work with getting your gems. Um, I think some of you came in later, so you don't remember the whole Ho'oponopono. I'm going to go over this again because this is going to be something that we're going to be using as we're picking up our gems. Ho'oponopono, again, is a um, Hawaiian meditation technique or prayer technique composed. The short version of it is composed of just four short um, syllables. I mean, sil um, not syllables, but um, clauses clauses in the sentence. And those four clauses are, I am sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. I am sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. And as we, this, this uh, technique was, was, was uh, presented to us by, again, Sister uh, Megan Adelaire. I think I said it right, um, at Mother's uh, celebration on Monday. But we, and when she did it, she said that you can use them to yourself, talking to your body to tell your body, your health, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. You can use them to help you with someone uh, in your life, but you need to say what? I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. You can do it for yourself. Because are you underestimating your own value? Some people, what do they call it? They call it uh, uh, self-worth. Are you underestimating your worth? If you're underestimating your worth, you need to tell yourself what? I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you for all you've done for me, and I love you. So again, when we pick up our gems, we'll, that we'll be using it. And I'll go over it again at the end of it so you remember it. But just think of those four. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Talk about the Ankh. And now we're going to do, go into the message that we have for this month from our Supreme Father, Marshall Davis. I can move this over to the side. Okay. Now, now this is going to start off by showing you why I said the Ankh is a mirror. It says, look into the mirror and make co positive comments about yourself in a form of an affirmation. The re results that you will truly desire will manifest for your current circumstances and for your future aspirations. Create new chapters in your life that are version, visions of a better life with better conditions. You are to dictate and determine your own life. Do not continue to accept lifestyles nor advice that has, no, that has not resulted in better conditions or better relationships. On every level, 
refused to be misguided, or, uh, I'm sorry, misused and misguided. Visualize and paint the mental picture of your life you desire to live. Write your desires in a book. Pray for fulfillment and affirm the manifestations of your desires each day. God is superior to all the challenges, confrontations, and concerns you encounter. Be determined to live a quality life. Have no fear of losing friends that are not truly beneficial to your life. Change yourself. Cleanse yourself on every level. Let go and release from within the things that do not contribute to your progress and spiritual development. Work towards designing meals that will heal and strengthen your body. Read, oh, you know, I did that wrong. Read the 25th Psalm three times a day. I got the 20th, 45th, I'm sorry, I messed up. Morning, noon, and evening. For each reading, please read the Psalm three times consecutively. When you have uh, successfully completed this spiritual task, you will have read the 25th Psalm nine times a day for a tremendous blessing. Burn green candles this month uh, and repeat uh, daily silent prayer. So this is also talking about silent prayer. I think I got the 50, 45th song from Mother's Message instead of this message, which is 25th. Okay, so I got the, uh, the song we read today was from Mother's Message, not from this message. So and next we'll be using this one. So in Mother's Message for us, it was saying use the 45th Psalm, and this one, it was saying, use the 25th Psalm. But, and I like to read through it before we t talk about it. So I've just read through this message. And since I've talked a lot about other things, I'm not going to uh, talk too long on this. But the first thing they're saying is about look into the mirror and make positive comments about yourself in the form of affirmation. Now, that's what you're going to be doing with the Ho'oponopono. And if you came in and looked at the back altar, what is sitting back there? A mirror. <laughs> so there's a mirror back there for you to look into and to make these positive comments about yourself in the form of an affirmation with that mirror there. You can pick the mirror up. You can leave it there. You can use whichever side of the mirror you want. One side is like a, 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 a small view, but if you flip it over, you can get one where it magnifies, you know, it magnifies and get close up on you, whatever you think is more beneficial to you. And be able to do these things of using that to try to tell yourself to be positive about yourself, which is kind of what Ho'oponopono is doing when it's telling you, forgive yourself for some of the mistakes. Because you money, many of the mistakes you made in life, you made them because you what? You didn't know better. Just think of how many mistakes you made in your life because you didn't know any better. How many mistakes you made in life because you thought you were sure that you were doing the right thing? We don't usually make mistakes in life saying, oh, I'm doing the wrong thing, but I'm just going <laughs> to... No, it, it, do it anyway. You're usually saying, no, it's some benefit I'm getting out of this. It's something that, you know, I'm thrilled for about this. So I'm going to do this because I might be ignoring some things, but I'm actually doing it for some good purpose in my life. And in that case, you need to tell yourself what? I'm sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> Thank you. And I really do love you. <laughs> we should love our life. Love the benefits we're getting from it. And part of that love is to be able to do what? Is to be able to look in that mirror. Look at life. And that's why I was wanted to make that com the comparison between life and the mirror. Because that's what we do sometimes with the mirror. We want to check out to make sure what? How we're looking. How we're how we getting along. And we can use life no longer the same way. You can use it not just to hold you back, but if you look at your life and you see in that or that mirror and you see it's something not right. If you had a mirror and you looked up there and you saw that, you know, uh, you had put your makeup on wrong, what would you do? 
You're corrected. And you, and you wouldn't sit up there saying, you know, go through a long thing. You wouldn't say, oh, this is wrong. I got to call somebody and talk to them. <laughs> I got to, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, I've, I'm, I'm going to have to look, you know, let this go. You would say, what? I'm looking in that mirror. It's messed up. I'm not going to walk out of here and know that my makeup is messed up. I am going to correct it. But with our lives, we do what? We ignore it. And we kind of try to hide it in and hope nobody doesn't notice it. And sadly, people notice more things that you've got wrong in your life. Usually sometimes they notice things you're doing wrong in your life more than they recognize the things that you're doing right in your life. Because with, as people, we can see the faults in others much quicker than we can see the faults in who? In self. But just you be using life like that mirror, so you use this meditation where you're using that mirror as a way of saying, in my life, I'm going to do that. I want to check myself out. And if I'm doing something that is not conducive to me having a better life or a higher consciousness, I'm going to do something to change it. And that's why I didn't talk about to visualize and paint the mental picture of your life. So I talked about this a little bit in our, our mother service too. One of the most big thing was to do what? Mental picture. Because th this talks about, and remember, this is just a message that Marshall gave us at the beginning, you know, at the beginning of the year. And I just happened to pull a, me pull a message from mother to talk about the same thing, silent prayer. Last Sunday, we talked about silent prayer. And one of the things we talked about in silent prayer is that a silent prayer does not mean that you're not making mental images during that prayer. You're not doing anything with that prayer. You do need to do something with that prayer. And, and, and Mother's message, it tells us about uh, having a mountain. Uh, if you notice on most of these pages, there's a mountain in the background. And I put that mountain in there to remember the message, and we'll be probably using that background for, uh, for this year is that mountain that she talks about in that message where she's telling us to picture a mountain and this is why she's telling you silent prayer but she's saying that silent prayer imagine a mountain and imagine that you are climbing that mountain with strength and courage and this is a form of a silent prayer now when we think of a silent prayer we think that well we're going to sit there we're not going to say anything we're not going to do anything but when mother tells us about a silent prayer she says what picture a mountain Picture yourself climbing that mountain with strength and courage. And that can be a what? A silent prayer. Feeling that strength, invigorating your muscles, feeling the courage you need to uh, when there's some problem on that mountain or something that you have to overcome as you're climbing that mountain. And picture whatever that problem is that you are solving it in your mind. And all of this is doing a what? A silent prayer where well, you're not talking. You're not saying a lot, but you are doing some things during that silent prayer. And if you're smart, you make sure in that silent prayer that you what? You get all the way to the top of the mountain. Whatever you have to think or do, you would try to make sure you do what? Get to the top of the mountain. If you have to see a lifeline come down to you and somebody and people pull you up to the top, you do what? You want to get to the top of that mountain. If you want a bird to come from somewhere and, 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 and fly you to the top of that mountain, you do what? And you know, if you're thinking, think, oh, that's funny. But sometimes when you're praying, guess what? You'll be doing it and those type of things will happen to you. Native Americans do, do, do those type of things a lot in their their prayers that they're, they're doing. They'll be taken to a certain place and they'll just wait to see what animal comes to help them to get to the, uh, get to the, to the next thing, get to the answer. Because they usually what they'll do is they will have a question. See, and that's what a lot of people don't do. They'll have a question when they go into their prayer and then they'll let them take them to a scene. And when they get to that scene, they will wait to see what type of animal comes to help to carrying them on their way to another place that gives them the answer to that question. But when we want to pray, we want somebody to do what? 
No, give me the words that I have to use. Give me the magic words. I, th I think I talked, we're not, no, I talked about this last Sunday. Give us, give us the word abracadabra. And if I can say abracadabra, then I know it's going to work. And this saying, forget abracadabra. Make a mental picture of you achieving what you want to achieve in that silent prayer. So any other questions? I don't know if Teresa's scratching there. <laughs> you got a comment? You want the mic to make the comment or are you saying you just want to make a comment? Well, Deacon Jackson can't hear you. Well, Deacon Jackson can't hear if you don't use the mic. Deacon Jackson, uh, Yes, sir. Teresa, yeah, Teresa. Teresa has a comment, but I'm gonna have to give her the mic. That means I got to turn okay. off my mic. One second. Turn off my mic, and you know, next voice you should hear is Teresa. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Teresa. Can you hear me, Deacon? I guess not. Yes, oh, you hear me? Okay. Um, when you first, that first line, you said, look into the mirror and make positive comments about yourself in the form of an affirmation. The song came to my mind by Mary J. Blige, where she looks in the mirror every morning and says, good morning, gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. Gorgeous. And y'all think that's not a good prayer. But with a lot of people, they have been so depressed in their life and they feel that they're, uh, they get to the point that they think that they're ugly and unimportant. And you need to get to yourself and say what? I am gorgeous. It would just be, um, who was it? Um, I can't think of sign. Uh, Reverend Jackson, Jesse Jackson, just used to say, he had the thing about him said, to pray what? I am what? Somebody. So we do need to use that process to help us to be lifted up in life. That's what I said, Jesse Jackson. You should say, I am somebody. I'm saying I, I, some of the things Jesse Jackson did, I, I'm not uh, endo endorsing them or condoning them, but he did tell us those things about looking at yourself, charging yourself, and actually giving yourself permission to do the wonderful, great things that you do in life, no matter what else has happened to you in life. And with many people that, you have, that have hindered you, Say the prayer to them or for them. To what? Because some of the people that have done you wrong in life, you need to tell them and say, no, I'm sorry that you didn't, get an, you didn't get a better understanding of me. Please forgive me for not knowing what you were going through when we had this misunderstanding. Thank you for even caring for me, because a lot of times when people who do things to you wrong, they think they're showing you care. Whether they do it in the wrong way or not, what? They think they're showing the care for you. So you said, thank you for what you were trying to do for me. And then most importantly, what? I love you. So um, just to finish off, the only thing, uh, announcement I wanted to make Today was that tomorrow is uh, Supreme Fo um, uh, Master Malvin's birthday. It's on the 28th of November. Um, thank you for all who have made donations to us and helped us to continue this ministry. We're thankful for you. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, for the online portions, because we're about to get to our consecration, 
Let me say, may the love of God illuminate your way. May the will of God direct you each day. May the truth of God all errors depart. And may the peace of God forever dwell in your heart. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, that ends our recorded session. If I can get the recorded on.